Hey guys, this is Dr. Harrington, and today we're going to be talking about stroke. <clears throat> now, this is a broad topic. Fortunately, a lot of this is review, but we are going to have to move fairly quickly. <clears throat> so, to begin, why is this important in the base case? Well, it's the leading cause of disability in the United States, and it it's the fifth leading cause of death or a contributing factor in the fifth leading cause of death. Uh, remember, lots of folks who suffer strokes end up with aspiration pneumonias, with bed sores, um, with more chronic illnesses, okay? And 3 to 4% of strokes occur in 15 to 45-year-olds, so this is not uniformly a disease of the elderly. And 20 to 25% of these are cervical artery dissection, so while those are rare on the whole, they're important as a cause of stroke-like syndromes in younger folks. The other reason that I think it's important to learn is because, as C.M. Fisher once said, neurology is learned stroke by stroke. By studying strokes, by studying what happens in a small or sometimes large area of the brain stops working, we can learn what each of these areas does and what they contribute to the whole. So, most basically, what is a stroke? Well, a stroke is any disease process that interrupts blood flow to the brain. Okay, so oxygen and nutrients can't get to the cells of the brain. Now, infarction is considered a brain, spinal cord, or retinal cell death attributable, attributable to ischemia. All right, now, if this is transient, it's called a transient ischemic attack. If the deficits last longer, and right now that time period seems to be about one hour, then it's called a stroke. So a mini stroke, as a lot of folks say, or stroke-like symptoms that quickly resolve, Okay, so stroke-like symptoms like hemiparesis that get worse and then better is called a TIA. And your patients do that as they walk out of the hospital. Now, more specifically, these are the definitions of transient ischemic attack. So a transient episode of neurological dysfunction caused by focal brain, spinal cord, or retinal ischemia without evidence of infarction. And this is a clinical definition. The other definition is a temporary neurological deficit caused by a CVA, a cerebrovascular disease that leaves no clinical or imaging trace. So now we have an imaging definition. And you're going to see this come up several times, and it's a very important distinction to make particularly if you're actually going to read the literature and try to understand what's going on here. <clears throat> so you see the tissue-based definition of TIA. All right. <clears throat> the next thing you need to know about TIAs is 20, about 25% of uh, diagnoses of TIA are incorrect. And about 25% of TIAs have, uh, or what is initially diagnosed as a TIA, have either a positive CT or more often MRI brain findings. So this is actually anatomically an infarct, although clinically it's a TIA. Now, ER docs are notorious for this, but there was a great study that I like out of Stanford in stroke 2010. <clears throat> Uh, and it was called Agreement Regarding Diagnosis of Transient Ischemic Attack Fairly Low Among Stroke-Trained Neurologists. And what this article showed was um, that the likelihood of a TIA seen in the ED by neurology fellows and stroke neurologists, <clears throat> based on a retrospective review by a separate fellow trained stroke neurologist at follow-up, um, demonstrated a raw agreement between these two of about 50 to 70 percent. So about half the time, the follow-up neurologist disagreed with the initial interpretation. Now, there were only 55 people in this study, but it did suggest that the diagnosis of TIA may be way more difficult than we give it credit for. All right. And then lastly, the outcome of these is better if the patient is admitted to a stroke unit. All right, and there are several reasons for this, but these can be complicated patients. At the end of the day, what this suggests is what's really important about the treatment of these um, is that we take them seriously and that the person taking care of them, and usually the nurse, really believes in their job to take care of stroke patients. All right, these people, people get appropriate follow-up care. They get appropriate risk stratified. And the reason for that is that when you look at TIAs, about 10% go on. Uh, progress to have a full-out stroke, a CVA, in, uh, within six months, and half of those happen within seven days. The highest risk is in about the first three days. So from an ER perspective, this is what we're going to tell our consultants, and this is the reason we admit these, because there's about a 1 in 10 chance this person is going to go on and have a stroke. All right, it's a big, big chance. Now, what if they have a stroke-like symptom, and we're going to talk about what those are, um, and then symptoms persist. So we've got something like hemiparesis, and this gets worse, and then either levels off or maybe staggers up a little worse. Well, that's a stroke. 
All right, that's an ischemic stroke, or at least classically what we think of. And the formal de definition here, um, at least as one example from the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, or NINS, is an acute brain disorder of vascular origin accompanied by neurological dysfunction that persists for longer than 24 hours. Now, this was the original way we differentiated between, between a TIA and a stroke. A TIA was less than a day and a stroke longer. All right, but this is time... All right, versus a tissue-based definition, just like we saw with TIAs. There are a few other definitions that differ a bit depending on the organization and the year that this was published. So this definition sounds like a clinical definition, but let's look at some other available definitions on the buffet of medical terminology. Okay, the American Heart Association uh, describes this as a neuro neurological deficit attributed to an acute focal injury of the central nervous system by a vascular cause via pathological imaging or clinical evidence with other causes excluded. So this is an imaging-based definition. The World Health Organization, on the other hand, describes it as a rapidly developing clinical signs of focal or global disturbance of cerebral function lasting more than 24 hours, much like the NINS definition, or leading to death with no apparent cause other than that of vascular origin. So this is a clinical definition. Now, this may seem like I'm getting picky, but it's really important because research on stroke will often use whichever definition suits its needs better. So, for instance, if they're trying to ins include as many strokes or what we're going to define as strokes as possible, rather than, say, stroke mimics, they're going to use a clinical definition. So they give themselves a high true positive rate because everything they call a stroke is ultimately considered a true stroke. Okay, Basically, they uh, administer the test and also grade it. On the other hand, if they want to justify treating lots of people with strokes, for instance, rather than TIAs, then they're going to include all the imaging TIAs. All right. <clears throat> so these people may resolve on their own quickly, but ultimately have findings consistent with a stroke. So you're going to take all of the worst TIAs and you're going to put them into the stroke category. So they're going to be the best looking stroke. And this actually creates something called the Will Rogers effect. If you've never heard of that, that was when he said, that when, all, when Oklahomans migrated out to California, it made both groups smarter. So think about that for a minute. But uh, it, it does come back in research, and it's very, very important, particularly if you look at research across time, um, who they include in groups. And here's kind of an interesting example of that. Uh, it, it, there was a study uh, that I pulled this straight out of. In our study, patients with neuroimaging negative ischemic stroke results were not automatically considered as stroke mimics because the diagnosis of stroke is clinical, not radiologic, corresponding with the definition of the World Health Organization. And this is pretty unusual because usually you see it going the other way. So researchers will use whatever definition suits them the best. And I think that's very, very important to understand. This is a very important place to understand it. So moving on, the varieties of the CVA experience. experience. Now, notice one thing about these previous def definitions is they only say there's a neurological deficit secondary to a vascular cause. But vascular cause is a broad term and can include a lot of problems. Okay, so broadly, this can be divided into ischemic and hemorrhagic causes. Ischemic basically means that something's blocking blood flow, okay, like a dam. Hemorrhagic means the blood is spilling out of the irrigation channel before it reaches the field. Okay, so it's spilling out in the wrong place and not reaching its destination. All right. Kind of an easy way to remember this. We're just going to narrow it down to the basic things. Um, but these are important to understand because the different mechanisms explain the different syndromes we see in stroke. So thrombosis tends to have a stuttering course, while embolism tends to be sudden and severe. Bleeds usually don't stick to a specific vascular distribution because they can bleed across the lines. All right, and they tend to be associated with a headache. Carotid dissection, as you can imagine, the tearing of a vessel tends to cause pain wherever that vessel is and can cause problems distal to that. All right, and compression, say from a, a brain mass from a neoplasm or cancer, right, uh, can cause a headache if it increases the intracranial pressure. And lastly, global hypoxia, so when the blood vessel turns purple, right, can cause decreased blood flow to the entire brain, which can cause stroke-like syndromes. Now, thromboembolism is the most common cause of stroke and TIA. It accounts for 85% of all strokes, all right, 
<clears throat> now, alteplase or TPA is the recommended therapy, but despite what some literature says, there is some significant controversy surrounding this medication. I like to call it liquid money. All right, we'll get to that later. Hemorrhagic strokes account for somewhere between 10 and 15% of all strokes, and they can inc include intraaxial or parenchymal, and that means it's inside the matter of the brain, or extraaxial, so along the surface of the brain, which would be things like subdural hemorrhage, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, epidural hemorrhage. These guys usually present with headache, vomiting secondary to increased intracranial pressure, altered mental status, and or focal deficits, uh, usually cranial nerve deficits with these. <laughs> Dissections can be from the aorta, and this tends to present with sudden onset of severe, so sudden onset severe chest and back pain. It tends to have a pulse difference in the extremities um, or a blood pressure difference in the extremities. But remember, this can present with neurological deficits if it extends up into the carotids or uh, the vertebral arteries, which come off the subclavians, right? Now, otherwise, these tend to be carotid or vertebral artery dissections, and this classically presents after trauma, which may be minor, okay, like whipping your head to the side because you got startled or chiropractic manipulation, and causes unilateral neck, face, and head pain. And this accounts for about a fifth of strokes in people between the ages of 15 and 40. All right, so this is a young people's stroke. <clears throat> Now, this causes stroke by one of two mechanisms. Either as a clot fills the false lumen of the dissection, it embolizes uh, to tributaries of the, the subsequent arteries, or the, uh, the clot and the dissection can expand and occlude the lumen of the vessel. And then you can have an entire, for instance, carotid uh, artery stroke. Now, there are some other more rare causes that I think are at least worth you hearing now. They're unlikely to show up on tests at this point, but they'll come up um, later down the line. Okay, so these include cerebral sinus thrombosis, and this is more common in hypercoagulable states. That's your buzzword here. So, for instance, the peripartum period or postpartum period um, is usually where the our ER board questions come from. It can be associated with malignancy or active infections or associated with genetic or acquired prothrombotic states. All right, this usually involves a headache, may include altered mental status, focal signs and symptoms like hemiparesis, and this can be bilateral. It can also uh, involve aphasia. And seizures is another classic finding that we have. All right. Uh, vasculitis can cause this. For instance, uh, lupus. Uh, and inflammation can cause edema of the vessel, uh, the vessel wall with obstruction. It can also kind of create a th prothrombotic uh, milieu for an actual stroke to happen. Occlusive diseases like sickle cell, thrombocytosis, okay, so too many platelets, right, which once again make you more likely to clot. Polycythemia, same way. And then sepsis, septic emboli. And we've seen this several times where people come in with, for instance, infective endocarditis. Okay, they have bacteria sitting on the... Uh, the valves of their heart, and this spits off, and it embolizes into their lungs, into their mesentery, into their brain, and they can have actual strokes from this. So this is a quick review. You guys should have learned this in other classes, but to make sure you understand it, what strokes? All right, so there are uh, several ways that you can stroke. There's the watershed, and we mentioned this earlier when the blood vessel's purple, right? There's not enough oxygen. Then the areas in between arterial distributions don't get enough oxygen and glucose and nutrients, and they stroke in a distribution like here in the middle. If you get occlusion, so like a thromboembolic disease or a, dis a proximal dissection, you get um, strokes in a predictable vascular distribution like the ACA, the MCA, the PCA, right? And then remember, bleeds can cause strokes, and these can cross vascular distributions kind of depending on the bleed. Remember, no, less blood than normal is getting through a bleeding artery, so you still may get an MCA-style stroke, but this may bleed across as the uh, blood irritates the brain regions, for instance, around a subarachnoid. So this is a quick review of the major regions of the brain by vascular supply. Once again, you should know this. In blue, you have the ACA, and yellow, the MCA, and pink, reddish PCA, and then all the um, deep area of the brains with uh, their uh, penetrating branches. Here you have the posterior circulation, and then here are those penetrating branches. This is just a review of the watershed areas of the brain in between the ACA and MCA, and MCA and PCA, and we'll come back to those in a minute. The sum of all this, though, is that the brain dies in predictable ways.
Okay, the key here is recognition, which means pattern recognition, which means seeing lots of strokes. So we're not gonna be able to teach you everything here, but hopefully we'll get you familiar with some basics. In general, the, the way that I think about this is, if I told you you needed to learn the geography of the United States, and in particular, there was a threat that areas of it were going to get wiped out. I would expect you to know some basic function of the different regions of the United States, right? So, for instance, the front of the country is colonized east to west, right? So the east coast, this contains the executive area of the United States, Washington, D.C. Although you may be thinking that is arguable, and it probably is. But much like the frontal lobe of the brain, it doesn't do much by itself other than regulate what the rest of the country does, right? And this is what the premotor or the prefrontal area of the frontal lobe does. You also need to know things about how the country gets its resources and how those get distributed throughout the country. Okay, this is the brain equivalent of arteries. You also want to know what it does with, with its waste in case that gets backed up and where it would end up going, right? So this is a very similar thing that you need to be familiar with the brain so that you can understand what happens when certain areas are destroyed. Um, so, first of all, life as the brain sees it. Once again, this should be familiar, the homunculus. So this is what your body looks like to your brain. Okay, remember the ACA and the MCA are responsible for these areas. These are on the parietal lobe and they dip down into the temporal. Um, and then your sensory is on the frontal, right? So your MCA is responsible for this area on the homunculus and then you can see it here on the, the side of the brain. Your ACA is responsible for the lower extremities and the genitals. Remember that the uh, ACA is also largely responsible for the frontal lobe. So you get frontal lobe changes. Moving into specifics. So the parietal lobe, this is the most highly lateralized cortex in the brain. More than anywhere else, lesions in this lobe manifest uniquely depending on the laterality. Is it right or is it left? So for instance, the dominant hemisphere controls complex language functions. So like Shakespeare, right? And then also calculation. So the right hemisphere, on the other hand, is responsible for spatial awareness and sensory integration. So this is where you get stereo, uh, stereognosis, the ability to mentally perceive shape by touch, right? Now, we just talked about the primary somatosensory cortex. Okay, this lies along the anterior margin of the parietal lobe. This is where your homunculus lies, right? So this projects anteriorly, anteriorly into the frontal motor association cortices and then posteriorly into the sensory integration areas. And this related parietal association area, so just posterior to this, and especially on the left side, assembles sensory information necessary to plan movements and especially complex movements. Okay, so if you think about it, damage to this can cause apraxia or the inability to perform an action. Okay, so for instance, if you uh, tell a patient to touch their nose, they can't because they can't plan for this. And this is because they can't integrate the sensation of their hand into a functional motor movement. But if their nose itches, they can reflexively reach up and do it. The muscles work right and the motor function works right. They just can't plan for it because of lack of integrated sensory input. So compare this to the function or the dysfunction of the frontal lobe, uh, which can also cause some kind of unique apraxias, but this is more well known for causing something called akinetic mutism. And this is where patients lack the will to move or speak, okay? Um, over here on the left side is also Wernicke's area, at least in the inferior parietal lobe, also the superior temporal lobe, okay? So it's called the perisylvian language zone. Um, and we'll talk about Wernicke's if, uh, area and Wernicke's aphasia here in a minute, but these guys have difficulty creating comprehensible language, right? So they also have more difficulty comprehending language because this is about language comprehension, all right? This is in contrast to Broca's aphasia, which is up in the frontal lobe, and we'll get to that here in just a minute. There's a little bit of vocabulary you need to know here from the left and, left and right hemisphere. So left hemisphere vocab, remember the left hemisphere is more responsible for language, for arithmetic and calculation, for understanding grantor and sent grammar and syntax. Okay, so problems over here can cause um, Wernicke's aphasia, and so you need to know things like paraphasia, so substitution of one letter or word for another. All right, sometimes these can be kind of subtle. Neologisms, we shall all have learned these back in high school English. It's a new, uh, and in these folks' cases, often meaningless word. And then jargon aphasia, which is classic Wernicke's aphasia. They string together words or phrases in an order that has little meaning, if any at all. All right. Now, realize the right hemisphere also has something to do with language. And if you think about the left hemisphere being more uh, calculating, calculating, 
and more responsible for syntax and grammar, the right hemisphere tends to be more the feeling and artsy side. Well, that's exactly what it does with language. So it creates something called prosody, which is the rhythmic or the musical aspects of speech. This is how we implant emotion into our speech, right? Um, so for instance, anger and sarcasm, sadness, this is how we both express and understand those subtleties to speech. Okay, it's called prosody. So there's motor aprosodia, which is the inability to convey emotion. So there was a really interesting case of a teacher uh, who had a stroke here and was no longer able to discipline her students because she couldn't express authority. She couldn't express anger. Okay, then there's also sensory aprosodia. This is the inability to understand emotion. And for any of you who watched The Big Bang Theory, this is kind of Sheldon uh, on that show, um, who's... Uh, typically unable to interpret sarcasm, right? Now, the parietal lobe also integrates other sensory, sensory information, so damage to the parietal lobe, kind of like damage to the temporal lobe, which we'll get to here in a minute, can result in agnosia, or not knowing, secondary to damage to the sensory association areas, right? Because there's lots of integration into the visual and auditory areas, as well as being the location of the primary sensory cortex, right? So damage to the non-dominant, usually the right uh, hemisphere of the brain, can result in difficulty with spatial orientation. And this can uh, result in difficulty with maps, as well as difficulty with finding locations. And this is usually seen in, for instance, an elderly person who suddenly gets lost in their own neighborhood. Okay, this also can result in neglect of the left half of objects, even the left half of one's own body. Now, this is usually secondary to an MCA stroke, and we'll talk about that here a little bit later. But the most interesting part about this is a little, sometimes they'll deny there's even a problem. Um, and some of them will even claim the affected limbs belong to somebody else. All right? It's almost like a phantom limb, only it's really there. Now, the other interesting thing about this spatial awareness and spatial orientation is that after damage to the left parietal lobe, the right can actually still direct attention to both sides. Okay, so you don't tend to see the neglect with a left-sided parietal lesion, although you have awful language deficits. But if you have a right-sided parietal lesion, the left hemisphere is only able to focus on the contralateral side, so the right side. So you usually have problems with the left side. All right, moving on. <clears throat> The uh, frontal lobe, all right, this contains the primary somatomotor cortex. So you think back to your homunculus again. This also has a premotor cortex, all right. Any damage here results in slower movements, um, problems with larger muscle groups, and then the supplementary motor area, and this can cause posturing. This is why we see posturing with some frontal lobe seizures and frontal lobe strokes, and this can actually involve muscles to both sides of the body. So we talked about frontal lobe partial complex seizures and how these guys can posture. And these are called hypermotor seizures because of how active these people are, okay? There's also a prefrontal cortex that's responsible for planning. Now there's also a frontal eye field here in the precentral sulcus. So this is the reason you look towards the destruction and away from irritation, right? So towards a stroke and away from uh, a seizure. So just like a train wreck, you can't take your eyes off it and your annoying sibling who you roll your eyes and look away from, right? Um, but this happens here because of that frontal eye field. And we just noted here that the parietal lobe sends projections into the frontal lobe. So this also explains why in damage to the frontal lobe, particularly on the right side, the non-dominant hemisphere, you can get neglect as well. Although this tends to be more like an uh, a kinetic mutism, you, you lack the uh, motivation to move, although you may still sense it. So it's more of a motor neglect. And then up here on the dominant, usually left side, is also Broca's area, and this um, creates an, ex an expressive aphasia. You cannot say words, you cannot recall words. Once again, we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, also important about the frontal lobe is this cortex is usually commonly publicized in relation to uh, those who need it most, which is teenagers. Um, so their poor judgment, impulsive activity are really classic of those with frontal lobe deficits. Now, the prefrontal cortex, and that's what uh, fails to function fully in most teenagers, 
uh, is primarily involved in controlling areas of other cortical areas. So we talked about this on our map. This is our Washington, D.C. This performs executive functions in the brain. So this includes things like planning, insight, foresight, and has a lot of aspects of personality. And uh, this is actually why humans have relatively large foreheads relative to most mammals. Now, this area has massive interconnections with the parietal, somatosensory, visual, auditory association areas that's involved in working memory, so the ability to keep something in mind. And if you think about that, that's important for things like planning and problem solving and maintaining attention. So people with lesions in this area and strokes in this area tend to have deficits in these areas, and because this is so complicated, they tend to be incredibly variable. Now, moving on to the occipital lobe, now's a really good time to review the difference between neglect and hemianopsia, okay? Because frontal lobe lesions, just like we talked about parietal lobe lesions, can cause neglect, all right? And so, for instance, in frontal lobe neglect, the patient will not voluntarily look left, but if you ask them to follow your fingers, they may reflexively follow an object to the left. And this can be a part of um, this lack of motivation, we think of motivation as I want to make an A, which they don't have, but they also may not have motivation to voluntarily move their eyes, their limbs, or whatever. Okay, so they may not consciously perceive the object as there, or they may lack the motivation to actually move their eyes that way, but will uh, more or less unconsciously do it. With hemianopsia, okay, which means to not see one half, the patient will neither look left nor follow an object left past the midline because that whole side of their world doesn't exist. And that gets us into the occipital lobe, which is, as it sounds uh, sounds like, is primarily associated for vision. Okay, and the primary visual cortex sits back here, and it's responsible for seeing movement, colors, properties of objects. Okay, and there's some other more complicated association areas in the temporal lobe, which we'll get to next. But the destruction here results in the, con uh, the, the absence of conscious awareness of visual stimuli. So there are a couple of kind of rare, but I think they're informative lesions that have been noted. For instance, if the inferior occipital lobe is damaged, you can get isolated color blindness. If you get occipitotemporal damage, you can get motion blindness. So you cannot see things that are moving, but once they, once they uh, come to a stop, you can see them. Okay. Probably more important for you guys to know right now is that usually in PCA lesions, okay, posterior cerebral artery lesions, there tends to be macular sparing, okay, which means that one whole hemifield, so half of your vision is, is missing, is lost, except the thing you're looking directly at, all right? And this is thought to be because of the dual vascular supply to the occipital poles, now, there are lots of unusual visual phenomena possible with stroke and recovery of stroke. I think it's beyond the scope of this lecture, uh, but I think they're kind of fun to know about. Once again, just to kind of give you an idea of how the brain is structured. So there's things like optic allesthesia, okay, and this is abnormal object orientation in space. So this is like a real-life Picasso painting, okay? Some of these people have recovery of motion perception only, so it's called Riddick's phenomenon. Okay, so they can see things that are moving, but not when they're at rest. There's visual confabulation, which is really entertaining. Confabulation meaning you're making things up. So they may actually have complete hemianopsia, but when you ask them if there's something over there, they might, may start telling you things that aren't there and they're not hallucinating, um, but they're just making things up. This tends to be associated with anisognosia. They don't consciously realize they have a problem, and so they're just trying to fill in the blanks with their imagination. Okay, now, we just discussed the occipital lobe projects forward into the temporal lobe into visual association areas. Now, hearing does that as well. You have your primary auditory area here, and it projects forward through the temporal lobes. Okay, back behind that, you have your visual area, and this projects forward. So any deficit here can cause a visual agnosia. And like I said a moment ago, this area is a bit more complicated. It has more complicated association areas. So what we tend to find here is something called prosopagnosia. And that is the inability to recognize faces, even familiar faces. And often these people come in uh, because they don't recognize family. Um, now, this may also be because of a lesion in the occipital cortex. And you can see uh, particularly an area on the uh, kind of occipital temporal border. And this is because of inter, uh, disruption of those association areas. 
Now underlying all this, remember, is the hippocampus and the amygdala, and so this all has a great deal to do with learning and memory uh, if damaged. Now, remember, regarding those auditory areas and the primary auditory cortex and the auditory association cortex that lie here, these project bilaterally. So a unilateral lesion should not cause hearing loss, or at least not significant. There may be a subtle difference, but they should be able to hear out of both ears. Okay, this in contrast to damage to a unilateral, for instance, uh, somatomotor or somatosensory cortex or unilateral visual cortex where you have complete loss of function. All right. Now, remember we talked about in the parietal lobe uh, section, Wernicke's area sits uh, kind of in between, snugged in between the uh, superior temporal lobe and the inferior parietal lobe in that perisylvian language zone. So you can also get um, a Wernicke's aphasia with damage here. But remember, almost all of this is supplied by the MCA. So an MCA infarct, it doesn't matter so much which lobe it's going to get at all. So very quick visual review. The temporal lobe houses the inferior part of Wernicke's area, so you get language fluency and basic grammar and syntax. It houses the primary auditory cortex and the auditory association cortices. It receives projection from the occipital lobe and contains visual association areas, which is why we tend to see a prosopagnosia here. Lastly, it houses the hippocampus and amygdala responsible for emotion and memory. So you can expect deficits to cause problems. Um, with visual association, all right, particularly with recognizing objects, all right, because of these association areas. It can also potentially lead to problems forming memories, so particularly anterograde or forward going memory formation, as well as emotional processing. Remember, hearing should not be that significantly affected and damaged here because of the bilateral representation. Oh, yeah, elephant for memory because elephants never forget. All right, now that is the end of this. This is a, well, not so quick review of the basic parts of the brain that I think you need to know to understand what happens when something strokes.